Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm taking a look at another one of Answers in Genesis Check This Out videos. This one is called Evolution Refuted. No uncertain terms there, so obviously they think they have a clincher with this one, so let's see what they got. You hear this one a lot. Science has proven evolution, therefore evolution is true. Close, but not quite. More like science has collected enough evidence that supports evolution to conclude with reasonable certainty that evolution is true. Since evolution is true and Christians don't believe it, then Christians don't believe science and they aren't rational people. Except that the majority of Christians do accept evolution to be true. Unless you're not counting Catholics as Christians, which wouldn't surprise me to be honest, but even then, I'm not sure the numbers of Protestant denominations that accept evolution, but it is a significant number. It's the creationists that tend not to be rational people, and even then, it's an overgeneralization to say that they're all not rational. It's quite possible that they are rational people, but they live with significant cognitive dissonance. David Wood is an excellent example of that. He is generally pretty good at debunking Islamic claims, and at showing how irrational the religion of Islam Islam really is, but he manages to completely ignore the fact that the same can be said about Christianity using the exact same arguments that he uses against Islam. All this to say, it looks like you're just setting up a straw man of a false dichotomy coming from us, that is, atheists, which just isn't true. Really, let's put that claim to the test. Okay, sure, why not? By all means, go ahead, test the claim that was never made in the first place. Okay, maybe some atheist somewhere has said something like that, but I don't really think it's something that the majority of atheists would actually believe, and it's not something that I have ever seen promoted by an atheist with any sort of influence. First off, evolution in the sense that things change is evident. No rational person disputes that. Okay, but I thought we were talking about biological evolution here, as in the changes of allele frequencies within a population over time. So what does your oversimplification of things change have anything to do with that? I mean, aside from the obvious alleles are things, that is. Therefore, rational Christians believe it. We can observe change, but evol- What is that? It looks familiar. Let me try something. <sighs> there it is. Why are you guys using a giant joint to illustrate your point, man? Dude. I made a rhyme. Evolution in the sense that life came from non-life. Life coming from non-living but organic molecules is not a part of the theory of evolution. We don't know enough about it to develop a working theory right now, but we have several competing hypotheses that are being tested. We will likely never know exactly how it happened, but we are learning more and more every day about different ways that it could have happened. Suffice it to say for now that we know amino acids can form naturally, and if amino acids combine in the right environment, they can form some very rudimentary lifelike molecules. It doesn't take much to realize that the hundreds of millions of years where the Earth likely had several different environments that would have made these combinations possible were more than enough to result in some pretty basic self-replicating life. And once you have replication, you have variation between generations, and then evolution by means of natural selection can take it from there and then that life began to randomly generate new genetic information, and over time it eventually produced humans? It didn't randomly generate new genetic information. It reproduced, and each generation would have been slightly different than the last. Sometimes, yes, with new genetic information. Sometimes with less. Sometimes with the same amount, but slightly different. Sometimes with the same amount and exactly the same. I think that one would be the rare one of the bunch. The ones who were better suited to the environment survived to reproduce again. The others did not. Remember, evolution is directionless. If you must picture a direction, then think of evolution as going in all directions at once, with natural selection culling out the ones that evolved in a direction that is unfavorable in their environment. So looking back on it from now, it can look very directed, but there is plenty of evidence out there to suggest that evolution really didn't have any particular end in mind. A fun read on this subject is an article from smithsonian.com, link in the description, which goes through 10 quirks that our bodies have that can cause us problems ranging from annoying to severe, which are all direct leftovers of the evolutionary process. If evolution or natural selection had humans in mind as a goal, it would have gone about things much differently than it did. And the same can be said for any animal, but the individual quirks will vary. Is something entirely different, and something that quite honestly doesn't hold up against science. Right, which is exactly why 97% of scientists accept the theory of evolution. Makes perfect sense to say that 97% of scientists accept a theory that doesn't hold up against science. 
In other words, evolution in the sense of molecules to man is not scientifically plausible and therefore should not be viewed as scientific fact. So if transitioning from molecules to man, as you put it, isn't scientifically plausible, then please explain how gestation works. You literally started out as two cells, two incomplete cells that only had half a set of chromosomes. Just a glob of molecules, really. Now you're a fully grown man, I assume. So you literally went from being just a glob of molecules to being a man in your own lifetime. And you're suggesting that this is not scientifically plausible? I know that wasn't evolution happening in the womb, though certainly there was some of that going on too, but it just demonstrates unequivocally that it is entirely possible to start with nothing but a glob of molecules and then have it end up being a fully developed human being. This is also ignoring the fact that a fully grown human being is essentially just a bigger glob of molecules, so technically we just went from a small glob of molecules to a big glob of molecules. Unless you're suggesting that we're not actually made of molecules, which I sincerely hope you're not. If you are, I've got some nice magic school bus episodes for you to watch. You can see that everything is made up of tiny little bits. Oh, amazing, isn't it? And the little bits are called molecules. And everything in the world is made up of molecules. Quite honestly, it is in great opposition to science. Again, I would like to point out the sheer idiocy of saying that a scientific theory that 97% of scientists can agree on is somehow in opposition to science. And that was with a margin of error of 2.5%, meaning that should they have erred on the side of caution, it could very well be 99.5% of scientists. Of course, it could also mean it's more like 94.5, but with the sheer number of scientists out there, and how few of them are affiliated with organizations like AIG and ICR and the like, I find the 97 to 99% range to be far more plausible. That is, observational science, the kind of science we can test and repeat and use our five senses to understand. Yeah, so the kind of science that we use to understand things like the age of certain fossils and how they relate to other fossils and living organisms, and the age of the Earth and how long life has existed on the Earth, etc., etc., and so forth. I go into more detail in my last video on the Check This Out series called How Science Works According to Creationists, linked down below and in the little card. Science demonstrates that over time, living organisms lose genetic information. They don't gain it. Would you kindly cite a source for that? You said that science demonstrates that, so please, show us the peer-reviewed paper published in a respectable journal that shows that every instance we have observed of a gain of genetic information is actually somehow a loss. And while I'm waiting, I must ask, why do you keep using that squeaky fart sound? I've now responded to two of your videos in this series, and so far we're two for two on videos where you use a squeaky fart sound. In short, what we're really asking is my original question. Science demonstrates that over time, that same science demonstrates that life doesn't arise from non-life. Hey, no, no it does not. In fact, biochemists are working hard to find out how life originally developed from non-living organic matter. So again, please point me to your source that says science says that life can't come from non-life. You didn't list any sources in your original video, so until you demonstrate otherwise, I'm just going to assume that you haven't even checked. Follow along if you would. Fact one, there is no known observable process by which new genetic information can be added to an organism's genetic code. So you've never heard of gene duplication then? An entire gene being duplicated is not only adding information to a genetic code, it's adding a lot of new information into the genetic code. There have been several papers demonstrating several mechanisms for gene duplication. Meta and Haber in 2014 described duplication by homologous recombination. Morikal described duplication by single-strand annealing in 2015. Duplication by aberrant recombination activities of topoiosomerases were described by Shaimalia et al. in 1990. Sorry for any pronunciation issues there, I'm sure there were more than a few. But I'm getting this list from the abstract of a paper on the mechanisms of gene duplication and amplification that was published in 2015. The full paper is available for free, link in the description. And duplication is just one way that genetic material can be added. There are also smaller insertion mutations, which are sometimes as small as a single base pair of nucleic acids being inserted into the genetic code. And then there are entire genome duplications, which happens quite frequently in the plant kingdom. Do you like strawberries? Well, most commonly cultivated varieties of strawberries have eight copies of their entire genome. That's one reason why strawberries are the plant of choice for showing genetic material in home experiments. There is so much genetic material there that it's not that difficult to extract enough of it to be visible to the naked eye, an experiment that I have done with my children. All you need are some berries, rubbing alcohol, dish soap, salt, some glass containers, a toothpick, and a strainer. None. That pretty much refutes evolution right away because there's no way to go from a fish to an amphibian without adding new information, right? Right. 
Except we know several different mechanisms that do add information, so consider evolution not refuted. I'm skipping a bit because all he does is ramble on about how you can't get very far without adding information to the genetic code, and he's right, you can't. But as I feel I have reasonably shown, information is added regularly, so there's no point in sitting through that. If living organisms cannot produce new genetic information, how can anything gradually change into something of higher intelligence or form or complexity? That is, how can anything evolve from an amoeba to a man without adding new genetic information? The answer, of course, is that it can't, plain and simple. Now, some have speculated and they have imagined all kinds of things, and they brought in artists to produce creative renderings based on guesses, and they have been successful in telling a very convincing story that humans evolved from ape-like creatures. But those are just drawings, people. They're just stories. You do realize that those are drawings that are based on extensive analyses of actual fossils, right? And even if they weren't, do you seriously believe that we consider the drawings themselves to be the evidence for evolution? Because nobody thinks that. Nobody. Find me one scientist who believes in evolution based solely off an artistic rendering of an early hominid, and I'll donate a month's income to AIG. But what we really observe is humans are humans, and apes are apes. And humans are also apes. It's a classification thing based on our physical characteristics. Even if you disagree with evolution, we are, by definition, apes. Now, if fact one buried evolutionary thinking deep into the Precambrian soil, this next fact, fact two, tosses so much sediment on it that not even the greatest team of paleontologists with the latest subterranean gizmo could dig up the remains. Well, since fact one is false, fact two had better be able to stand on its own without fact one, or you've lost the race before you even left the starting post. Check this out. Never, again, never has it been observed that life can come from non-life. Are you including the resurrections in the Bible in there, not to mention the original creation of life? And you're right, the process of life developing from non-living organic matter has never been directly observed. So here we have two competing hypotheses. One, that an infinitely complex and unfalsifiable being used a magical incantation to create life just a few thousand years ago, and the other that the Earth formed about 4.5 billion years ago and over the course of about a billion years, chemical processes that we know through observation and experimentation can happen naturally, took place and eventually formed the first of what we might call life. Now let's apply Occam's razor. Which hypothesis requires fewer assumptions? Well, since the beginning of life has not been directly observed, both hypotheses require the assumption that life did in fact begin, which I think we can all agree is a fairly safe assumption. For abiogenesis and evolution, the only other assumption is that these chemical reactions that we already know have a chance of occurring naturally did indeed occur naturally. For the creation hypothesis, though, you have to first assume the existence of a being that is far more complex than anything we could ever imagine, and then you must assume that this being used words to create everything, which is something that has never been observed to be possible. Then you need to assume that it is possible to animate clay or dirt in a way that will produce a human body. Then you have to assume that a rib from this body could then be animated into its own independent body. And this isn't even touching the assumptions that are required when denying all the scientific evidence that points to the Earth and universe being several billion years old. So in order for creationism to be true, you need to make several assumptions about the universe operating in a way that has never been observed or even hinted at. Whereas for the evolutionary view, you simply have to assume that chemical reactions that have been demonstrated repeatedly to be possible actually happened. So it looks like the evolutionary model is quite a bit more parsimonious than the creation model. So here are two major scientific evidences against evolution. I reiterate for clarity, life has never been observed to come from non-life. Again, I agree, but that does nothing to disprove evolution. And the assumption that life began naturally is far more plausible than it being the result of special creation. And there is no known, observable process by which new genetic information can be added to the genetic code of an organism. So molecules demand evolution doesn't really make scientific sense. If both of your points were accurate, I might agree, but the more important of the two points is glaringly inaccurate. Yet we are all here, and life is all around us in various forms. Although evolution cannot account for this, the Bible can. How so? Because it said God did it? Because there are plenty of other religious traditions that have different gods doing the same thing in different ways. You'll need to provide actual evidence, not just Bible verses. The Bible reveals that the all-powerful, all-knowing, supernatural God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing, and all life according to its kinds, that is, each with its own set of genetic information. All of which is either unfalsifiable and therefore scientifically useless, or has been falsified. That's it for this video, thanks for watching, remember to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and support me on Patreon. See you next time!